Bullshit Books. Tonight, the myths and the modes. Prana. Now that's not an English word or a Gaelic word. It's actually a combination of pra and na. Roughly translated, the first power of the of the body. Now in the West, we speak of when you go into the hospital, already they're going to take his vitals, they call it. Blood pressure, heartbeat, you know, all that. Okay. That's not prana. That's a manifestation of something that I'll get to. to read you an actual lecture of Swamiji that I typed to get us going. And then I'm going to come in from another angle, okay? So that'll just expand your <coughs> awareness. Can I, oh. can I ask a quick question? Yeah. About prana? When does it actually enter the body? When the baby takes the first breath. Okay. It's not in the embryo. The embryo is being disposed to receive life. That's why abortions, you don't kill the soul. The soul isn't there. It comes at the first breath. And the baby has 72 hours to decide whether it wants to stay. Isn't that interesting? Really? Yeah. So he's got a case to join. <laughs> Do I want to stay with this family? at this moment of history. Yeah. Swamiji used to work, watch births that way and talk to the baby. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Say, do you want to stay? Well, I don't know. What do you think? Let's look up I'll watch you when you come out. Take care of it. Oh, okay, I'm staying then. I'll catch up with you in about 20 years. Maybe. All right. Here's his lecture as best as I recorded it. <coughs> the chief manifestation of human life, breathing. Life and breath are essentially related. Anything that lives, breathes in some way. Air is the, air is breathed, <laughs> but it's not air that gives life. Air contains prana. What brings and keeps the body and mind together, yet, is inhaling and exhaling the life force. That life force is prana. It's not an energy, because that's a material something. This is a force. So, breath is not prana. Breath means asu, horse. Sanskrit. Breath is the horse and prana is the rider. Ooh. The oxygen breathe contains prana. It's all around you right now. And these two are not the same. Prana is that subtle energy or force through which your mind functions. It's supplied prana to the breather by the cosmic source. So long as the forces of inhalation and exhalation continue, life will continue. <clears throat> now, this is interesting. The breath registers the entire activity of the mind. Where do you hear this? The person's mental, emotional, or bodily condition is immediately disclosed by the breath's activity. This is your real thermometer. With rapid breathing, the blood pressure rises. 
with slow, gentle, smooth breathing, the pressure declines. When breath is regulated, then the entire met metabolism is working smoothly. And the regulation of breath is controlled by the motion of the lungs. And with the proper regulation of the lungs, the flywheel of the body and mind, everything about you comes eventually under control, even the autonomic nervous system. So you bring prana under control by working with the breath. You can't get to prana directly. You have to go indirectly through the breath because they're buddies. Huh? The horse and his rider. You can't separate them. This comprehensive control is made possible by stimulating the right vagus nerve. Ooh. That's a major nerve that's called the 10th cranial nerve which exercises control over the autonomic nervous system. When the mind directs the motion of the lungs so that the breath becomes calm and steady, then the action of the right vagus nerve gradually comes under supervision. Neither breath nor mind can function without each other, yet they are mutually influential. <coughs> Many diseases are rooted in faulty respiration, and many illnesses can be prevented when the exchange of gases is properly performed. Okay. Now, a sign of imbalance in the prana is the feeling of restlessness. Of course, none of you ever have that, right? When the lungs and the nervous system are overloaded, say, with the waste product, carbon dioxide, then the mind and the body are disturbed. A person's sensitivity is related to the purity and strength of the nervous system. An improper exhalation dulls one's feelings, even to degeneration. Okay. Now this is an interesting point. The very act of observing the capacity of the lungs brings their emotion under control. Isn't that interesting when you think about it? The observation brings under, you don't have to work at it. That, that, that to me is an amazement. And without this elementary, elementary regulation of the lungs, Meditation is impossible. That's why we always start with the breath. He goes on to all kinds. I didn't want to, this is the key thing because I want to connect it now to the next part. If you don't mind, do some of it, but it's from a different slant because it was written. Oh, by the way, that first one was written in 72. This one's in 83. In yoga, we sometimes come upon the term called prana, and the most contemporary way to interpret that is to simply call it power. It's a power that permeates all of nature. Uh, it's what keeps us alive. It pulsates through us. Yogis were analyzing this and they discovered that the principal sources of prana in our lives and throughout the universe are five. What do you think they are? Not bad. Trees. No. Food. Very. Who is this? Food. Food. No. Water. Water. Air. Air. Keep going. Yeah. <laughs> Do more. <laughs> food would be. That would be under food. Water. Three. Relationship. 
Very good. That's the supple one. We'll get into each one of these. You want to go one more? Mm -hmm. Will you ponder that? Nutrition, I'll call it. It covers water then, too. Even focus. <laughs> Okay, now let me see. So going back to Swamiji's lecture, remember he said the chief manifestation of life is breathing. But the first major source is not breathing. Well, they're not competing. They're really lined up and they assist each other. Oh, here you are. Now, hang out for this. In order to use prana, you have to introduce yourself to the center within. And sometimes people refer that as the kundalini. But the word kundalini Kunda and Lini is not the proper term. It's called Devatma Shakti. Ooh. And what is it? It's the latent power that makes us alive. Okay. So is it a Storehouse of prana? One of its manifestations okay. is prana, right? Prana one comes, of its manifestations. Came, comes out of it. It uses that for the embodiment of the soul. Okay? So the Maha Shakti is called the primal force of the universe. Now, hang on. There are three aspects that she must use in the person. You're going to love this one. Icha. Icha. Hang on. Jnana, G-U-I. And the last one? Anybody want to guess? Kriya. Huh? Kriya. Close. Action. You're right on. Karma. Karma. Which means action. <clears throat> that's all it means. There are repercussions, but that's all it means. Now, what are these? Hang on. This is one, this is two, this is three. One needs two in order to do three. Will. Knowledge or intelligence. Never mind my clear writing. <laughs> and this means doing it. In order to will it into action, I have to have knowledge to guide the willing. Those are the three main aspects that prana will exert in you for the kind of being you are. So, as human beings, when Shakti wants to manifest she will always use prana. That's her way of manifesting life, as the yogis understand in our tradition. So, any questions so far? What kind of knowledge or intelligence? Whatever. You want to scrub your car? Wash the dishes, make a bed, go on a vacation. 
So you ask yourself, hmm, what am I going to do this summer on my holidays? Now you're toying with knowledge. But you want to take a vacation. There's your will. Mm -hmm. So finally you'll put the two together, the timing, the money, and so on. Do it. When you fulfill the intent, you've got the karma. Mm -hmm. And that's some, those are major principles that run through all of human life. Okay, let's go. Now let's go back to the major sources again. And the first one we said was the sun. Oh, I'm saying the first one is the sun. Because it's the most prevalent. The most obvious. Just think what you would do without the diaphanous display of the sun. I love that word, diaphanous. Huh? It's there, but you can't see it, as it were. But you can see what it illuminates. Excuse me. I need some product. <laughs> now, all of the expressions of prana have an impact. It's not just being indifferent. So think for a moment, what does the sun do? Besides give you a burn? Mm -hmm. That makes things it grow. Makes things grow. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> you take the sun away, uh-uh, you can feed it water, vitamins, nothing's gonna happen without that sun. So look at the power of that. So there's certain primary uh, elements here that we've got to think about too. Okay, so sunlight is the first major source of prana. So in some mysterious way, as we say, it enables things to grow. So when you eat food, you, you could say you're eating the sun's energy. And you are. Second one. Food. The most readily available source next to air. And again, the quality of the food determines the status of the prana. Food can get stale, in other words, it loses. Swamiji often said, if you cook a meal, and you put leftovers in the refrigerator, don't go more than two days. Prana will just depart. Mm -hmm. And what do you notice about the food then? What's this flavor? It's not as tasty. That's right, the taste changes, because the prana is gone. Swamiji, what happens when you microwave food? <laughs> Swamiji says it destroys the prana. Isn't that interesting? Never microwave your tea or anything, he said. Because those are like, and Peter Kelly proved it in his, uh, <coughs> in his research laboratory. He's, he confirmed what Swamiji said. It changes the chemical makeup. Exactly. exactly. Scientifically. Just like, as you know, when you get honey, mm -hmm. and you're trying to clear the pollen away, if you raise the temperature above 100, 105, it changes the chemical content into a poison. Never buy store-bought honey. Always get the real stuff if you can, because you don't realize you're eating po poison. What about freezing foods? Freezing's okay, he said. Okay. Yeah. It's not as good as fresh, but it's it'll hold. It holds the prana. Now the third one, breathing. We live in an ocean of prana. It's all around you right now. It's free, available. It even gets polluted, but it's always there.
And the major factor determining the longevity and the quality of living of older people is their breathing process. Watch where older people breathe up here. That keeps more carbon in and degenerates the cells. Isn't it interesting? The used up portion can harm you. And yet you need a certain amount for your antagonistic muscles to operate. Your body knows how to regulate that. Okay. Isn't it interesting sometimes when you climb stairs too fast? What do we say? You're out of breath. Mm -hmm. But you're not out of breath. What's really happened is you filled the lungs with carbon dioxide, and that tires you. There's an interesting book called Running and Breathing, but you probably know. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard of Aveda. Have you heard of Jute? Mm -hmm. You know who the president is? Mm -hmm. Dave, Dave. Dave Wagner. Karen Grossman. Remember Karen? Mm -hmm. She'll see. She'll be with us this spring, or rather this fall. She just sent me an email said she was listening, to, she was in the classroom for a lecture at Columbia University a week ago. And the lecturer was Dave Wagner. And so Karen, she's a little old, she raised her hands and said, Sir, have you ever heard of a Swami Jaidev or Justin O'Brien? <laughs> and he said, that gentleman taught me how to breathe, walk, and run. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that nice? I wish yeah, I knew he was in town. I would have sent him a note. I'll tease him next time. I've always been impressed with him as a corporate head. Most corporate heads I can't stand, but I, I liked him. We got, we got along together quite well. He had me lecture in all his salons. There are five of them in Minneapolis and St. Paul on wellness. Okay, now we've got sunlight, nourishment, nourishment and breathing. Now the last two are very, very subtle. Let me describe a situation. You call up a friend and you say, let's meet for chai at Espresso Royale. It's a Saturday morning, you don't have much on your mind. And as you're driving, you're looking forward to it. You're perking up. That's prana. You greet your friend, you feel good, prana. Ideas can provide prana. Now that to me is amazing. So when Marty's doing research, say, and he finally starts to see a connection in things he's been working on, you get excited. Mm -hmm. That's prana. So you can stimulate your own prana. You don't even need a donut. <laughs> there isn't any prana in them. He takes it down. Yeah. I think it's yeah. So just thought, just good thoughts. Yeah. That's it. Don't you feel better when you have good thoughts? And what happens if you have absent thoughts? You block the problem. Seriously. You reduce it. You squeeze it out. E. So all depression is in the breathing. Think about that. I've worked with people years ago, and I said, do you want to stay on drugs? No, I want to get off the drugs, okay. Let's just uh, play a little bit. I got them to start doing the breathing. Come in and see me three or four days from now, we'll do the practice again. In two weeks, no more depression. 
you cannot get depressed if the right nostril <coughs> is open. I'm serious. You can't digest your food properly if the right nostril isn't open. But you don't want to sleep with the right nostril open. It'll keep you awake. It's the active side. You have the active, the more passive side. You need both, huh? I'll come back to that. Because I want to go to the last one. We said ideas. Each, this is connected to that idea one, to some extent. Each of you are radiating the degree of your development of prana in your personality. You've walked into a room sometimes, and you look around and you just, you don't want to go near those people for some reason. They haven't spoken to you, but you don't feel comfortable. That's prana. You radiate who you are. So it's the summation of everything. Your breathing, the food you eat, the diet, how you sleep, how you think about people, what's your philosophy of life, that all comes together in the final one. So you constantly radiate your being. Now here's the bonus. When you can get still inside, with your eyes open, you can read people. You know you do that sometimes. But you can get infallible in it. Why? Because you're so perfectly balanced and calm inside. You're simply gazing upon this reality, and your act of contemplation pulls it all in. Isn't that interesting when you think about it? So each of you bear your characteristics, your idiosyncrasies, your virtues, your <laughs> vices, all the qualities that make you up as a human being. <clears throat> That's why animals can sense you right away. They read you. You can do that too. Swamiji, what about movement being the source of prana? It is, of course. Dance. Your motor yeah. reflexes are all due to prana. It's the force that keeps you alive and makes you move. <coughs> Or rest. Huh? You got to have the will. All those have got to be in it if you're going to move, and not just sort of scratch your head. So any deliberate movement involves those three, and those are all aspects of prana. <coughs> now the the force that you convey by the person you are is not discernible by the rational mind. It's all intuition. It's a knowing without going through the work of getting to the conclusion. That's why you can just sense things about people, even about things. You're driving down Snelling. And it's a weekend, Friday, late in the afternoon. You don't want to go near the state fair because it all narrows down, right? But you thought you'd beat the traffic, but something says you're not going to, you're going to get caught. Oh boy. So we zoom over to Lexington. And you were right. It can work in practical life. But don't try it at a horse track. <laughs> Do a little more discursive investigation first. <laughs> then you kick in with your intuition. Now one more. It's connected to it, obviously. We've hit on it. You walk in the woods. And if you're really sensitive, as you cruise through, staying 
calm within, you can pick up the changes from the kinds of trees, the flowers, even the animals. You'll pick it up. It'll also affect your nostrils besides your sight. Because the aromas come off. By the way, you, your state of emotion gives off an aroma. And yogis can smell it. Just as animals can. That's why when you have a profound relationship with someone, you're extremely intuitive with that person. You just know. The moment they walk in the room, they don't have to say anything. Even if they had a smile on their face, you know, there's something up. Okay. Is there anything else here I've missed? Now, <clears throat> have you ever had this where suddenly you a friend of yours just came on your mind? Maybe the phone rings or you get a text. Well, look at this. It's the rapport you have. Huh? And the fact that you weren't so caught up with your task, it was just more in a receptive state, you'll pick up things that way too. Davey and I were, went for a drive. I thought I'd go for maybe two, three hours. And we headed east. Across the St. Croix into Wisconsin. And I was driving along. And there was a sign saying about this little town on the left. I said, oh, I've never heard of that. So I turned and started to go towards it. And all of a sudden I felt a wave of negativity. I couldn't shake it. In fact, even Davy said, do you feel it? I said, yeah. I turned around, went back. But then I went back to look it up on the map. It was a town full of American Indians. Obviously, they felt very suppressed. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. Maybe out of work and stuff. I was picking up all the negativity. prove it, but I don't fight that anymore. Mm -hmm. So there's a communication. In a sense, prana wants you to know its presence for what it is. Because your ability to discern even anything in this room is due to the presence of prana in you. If it leaves you, you won't be aware. It'll be a, a, a shriveling up, so to speak. It's like trying to convince someone of something when they're in a very depressed state. They're caught. Huh? They're not radiant with the prana as it should be. Swamiji, if prana leaves you, <coughs> are you on your way of dying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's what happens. Yeah. It starts to ebb. Okay. Four. Get me over again, but I'll let it go. Have any of you ever seen the portraits of J. M. W. Turner? They're magnificent. I've never seen anybody could capture the light the way he does. Mm -hmm. 
There is a magnificent movie I have tried so hard for 10 years to get a copy of it. I know they're out there, but it was a uh, documentary with Leo McKern playing the role of Turner. And the name of the movie is The Sun is God. Anyway, when I went to England, and I went to the museum where they had many of his portraits, I saw the movie and read about his life. Now, listen to what this guy did. Never got married. He wanted to capture a storm over the English Channel. Mm -hmm. He knew when there were certain freight boats that had to go across, even though there would be a squall huh? between France and England. It's not a long ride. It takes less than two hours, I think. Anyway, he paid the captain of the ship to come aboard, and the captain warned him, said, we're going to be going into a squall. He says, I know that. That's what I want. In fact, what I want you to do is lash me to the mast. <laughs> Can you imagine? Tie him? Yeah, yeah, tie him to the mast. That's a strong look. <laughs> That's yeah. a strong yeah. And he rode out the storm, constantly gazing upon it. Mm -hmm. Constantly, constantly. And then he went home and he painted it from memory. Oh, wow. Because he kept all the Prana remembrance in his head. And that's the way he painted a lot of things. He'd get up early in the morning and just watch the sunrise every day for, say, 30 days. Then he'd go home and paint it. Where do you see his writing, his paintings? Now that's really diving into Prana. Huh? But shows you the capacity. Shakti and prana are not synonymous. Prana is a form of Shakti. She releases it. That's one of her attributes. Now, the last description I will give you here, because it's 815, is a new definition of the divine. Are you ready? Just ponder this. The silent witness within. A seeming void, but not empty. Swamiji also speak of two basic principles. One he called the contraction principle and the other the expansion principle. So when you meditate, what are you doing? You're concentrating, you're contracting in order to expand. Which is interesting when you think about it. Well, that gives you a little glimpse of prana. Mm -hmm. so, uh, sometimes I've noticed in different yoga postures, the lungs feel different. So sometimes it's really hot, and sometimes they're not as hot. That's right. Is that due to prana? Mm -hmm. All the time. Yes. You want to get hot? Do Agnisara. <laughs> <laughs> really pump it. Whoa, that's how they heat themselves up in the cave in Swamiji's tradition. They don't have parkas. And believe me, it gets a little cool in the Himalayas, you know, at night. So they would heat up and then they would sustain it. That's another yeah. thing. You know, warm it up and then hold it. It gets through the night. 
Okay. It's time to go.